It's going to be a long one. of the pod he is dj schweitzer i am jeremy lance and we actually decided to do a podcast this week you're welcome we got random publicity for our podcast which is always an odd thing to happen during a two-week period where you don't put out a podcast um but uh like our local pr affiliate they have a podcast about podcasts very meta we were one of the featured podcasts uh, it was awesome to to get a nice little nod from, you know, any of the local media out there. Anyone who might be checking in for the first time, just know that this is like the most amateur show you're really ever going to tune into. Oh, and th- and that was on full display on that. I don't know if you like listen to the whole, like the other podcasts are like super well produced. One's about finance. One is like. Let's come up with like some big like like high level concept like futuristic thing of like this will be had this will happen in the future and how that would work out. And then there was like another one. Yeah, I mean just kind of more like very like heady topical things. And then it was like and uh, here's a snippet of these two idiots talking about Liverpool <laughs> <laughs> in their own living rooms over a bad Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it really highlights just how crap of a show we are. But I'm I'm super thankful to uh, to Trip Eldridge who who runs that show, who described our podcast as a uh, very localized yet intelligent point of view, which I guess just well, means 50% that fifty percent true. Yeah, right. We're we're definitely localized. There's there's no doubt about that. Uh, but yeah, I always love uh, the. Po- publicity and any any love we get this goes right up there with the time that cincinnati magazine mentioned us along with the jerry springer podcast as great local podcasts i mean that's definitely that's in still, i mean that's like a that's a career highlight right there. i mean it there's no way that you don't rank getting uh put alongside jerry springer's podcast uh as a local recommendation and your top accomplishments as a, a professional broadcaster just Peas in a pod. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. We we do have other we have other um before we get into the uh, soccer part of the the show that I think most people probably were here for we we do have we have, we have other news um we have now officially had the countdown to us not having to use shoddy Wi-Fi to do our our podcast. You got, got the jab. Yeah, I got the jab. I got vaxxed up today. Uh, first shot of the Pfizer. So I've got about three okay. weeks, three and a half weeks until I go and yeah. get my second shot. And then I've got what, about 10 days or so after that. Yeah. Roughly that. Yeah. Until what I'm going to call the freedom day where I'm allowed to, you know, interact with other humans again, most likely. Like uh, railings. <clears throat> yeah. Hug really strangers. Playing soccer again, you know, little, little things like that just seem like a, uh, a small luxury not long ago, but now seem like grand treasures that we've been waiting towards. But <clears throat> more importantly, that means the two of us actually get to sit together in a room and and actually record a podcast again, which for I'm genuinely excited that, about. Yeah, this say for the first time since uh, the first week of March in 2020. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. tweeted out like we've not seen each other in over a year, which. <clears throat> doesn't right. seem, I mean, we, we've seen each other over, you know, every time we record, we're looking at each other over this webcam. But at the same time, uh, it's just, it's not the same thing as sitting in the same room and getting to enjoy each other's company. And it's, I mean, I'm sure everyone who's listened to this show, regrettably, for longer than the last year, will will know that our timing and our ability to interact with each other is greatly impacted by not sitting in the same room. And so, I mean, it's it's just gonna be it's gonna be a relief in some respects to to be able to do that with you again. And um, yeah, I, w- I was excited to get the first shot today, and uh, 
as you said, we're we're like in five weeks away, roughly, before we can actually sit in a room together again. So you're gonna you you're gonna have to savor my voice glitching like Max Headroom for the <laughs> last few podcasts here, because hopefully soon here, um, it's just like the Premier League, how everything's opening back up in the UK, literally four days before the final Premier League matches, like, and fans will be back. Starting, it was like starting May seventeenth, and it's like the the final the final league matches are like May twenty. What do you? So one match. Yeah, pretty much. But that'll, we'll, that's basically what this. We'll be back for one match, uh, at least, and that will be exciting enough. Um, the the bigger challenge will most likely be now figuring out how we're going to hook up these two mics to one computer. We have five weeks to sort it out. <sighs> I have a feeling we'll be trying to sort it out the the night of. Yep. Tr- trying to get a uh like a little mixer box overnighted to us from Amazon. Yeah, most likely going to be the end up uh being that type of situation. Uh let's get to one other thing that nobody else wants to talk about, uh a fantasy update. I don't know about do you, we but have, I have I have an update. update. Yeah. Uh I haven't even looked at my team in like well over a month. Um, but I only fell three places to 47th. You fell no places to 90th. Uh, um, Tyler Kelly's Ole can't drive 12 shows in a row. He's fallen no places at all either. So a uh, pretty stationary thing. It seems like not many people are paying attention to their teams at this stage in the season. But, hey, uh, congrats to anyone who's still paying attention to fantasy because we're not any longer. I, I don't know if it's because we took two weeks off from the show because we had we were just super busy um this like international break i think it's because the there was what we had like fa cup stuff right before it like this international break has felt like super long like oh, i can't man. i feel like the last premier league match i watched was like a month ago i know i feel like, like it just the, feels the, very far away the content for this show feels like it spans like a month and a half of oh, yeah. because We've not we've not had a show, and that's like how long it's been since anything truly relevant has unfolded. But we we have plenty for you today. So not only are we going to be talking about some of this international soccer, uh, both embarrassing stuff and good stuff, uh, we also have an interview for you today, like a, a an even bigger rarity uh, than us doing a normal show uh, is the fact that we actually have someone else on to talk about it, and we're going to be welcoming on Kai Hessa from Schalke. He's an under-23 assistant coach uh, at the German club, and he's actually worked with American starlet Matthew Hoppe, who's really burst onto the scene in the Bundesliga for uh, for Schalke this season. So we'll be welcoming him on uh, shortly to talk a little bit about what it's like within their academy system, his rise within it, uh, both as a player and a coach, and to talk a little bit about Hoppe himself. But we'll be talking a bit about uh, the under-23s, how the full men's team is done, uh, and then, of course, we've, we've got plenty of Premier League stuff to ch- stuff in here, too. So lo- lots of stuff to, to to chat about today now that we're actually back. And we've got all this wealth of content. Where do you want to start this week, Jeremy? Well, a- as we are always apt to do, let's start with horrible things and disappointment. And that's, um once again, the U.S. men's, question mark, national team, uh, doesn't qualify for the Olympics. Yeah. Again. Again. What third? We don't have now. This time we don't have like Freddie or Adu or someone like that to to be bummed out about their performance. But but we do have other people, and I've heard of most of them. Get the idea. Obviously, like, <clears throat> hey, the men's playing the Olympics like that. That's a good watch. We love it. We love rooting for. Women's national team in the Olympics, obviously they are, you know, favored in basically any tournament they're in ever. Um, so that that's kind of an added element to enjoying that. Um, but like, I don't, and I think this goes, this kind of is like the starting point in the conversation of like the why and the, uh, you know, what needs to change and all that is like, I don't know, do, how much do you rate the U.S. playing in the Olympics, the U.S. men's playing in the Olympics? And how much does USSF rate playing in the Olympics for the men's? 
man. Um, it's technically once they actually are the Olympic team. Team. It's technically not even USSF, right? It's it's technically Team USA. Yeah, it is technically Team USA. Although Team USA defaults to US Soccer as the you know decision makers for all those type of decisions, but yeah, they got away with those stupid jerseys. Yeah, the, I mean, no patch has to be a flag instead. Just a weird bit. But regardless, um, let, let's start with the first question you asked, which was, wh- how do I rate, you know, us participating or not participating in the Olympics? And you know, I think the easy answer is probably the one that's where I stand with it is I think it's a disaster. And it's not necessarily like, yeah, missing out on one is is a bad thing. That's that's certainly bad. But it's that we've missed out on three in them in a row. And yep. You know, you, you can excuse one, you can kind of roll your eyes at two, but it's that third one where you kind of have to go, like, we can't really make excuses about this any longer. Like, we are hands down the wealthiest country within this federation. Yeah, there's only two spots. Yeah, the, the qualification system is difficult. Yeah, the, the player selections are difficult. And we'll get into all those things here in a minute. But we we still should have enough resources at our disposal to, in a 12-year span, qualify for one of three tournaments that rolls across in this system. And I do think it's incredibly important that we have a team and have players that are going through that type of tournament and that kind of microcosm of the World Cup. And yeah, like the, the Youth World Cups are meant to recreate those environments as well. But the more times you can put players into those pressure cookers, I think, is a good thing. Now, like I tweeted this out, too. Like, I'm certain that had this team qualified, given how it was configured, like they were they were going to get embarrassed in Japan regardless. Like the embarrassment was going to happen, whether it was in qualification or once they were in Tokyo, like regardless. So, you know, I think you will get into the reasons for that there. But if you want to ask questions about like why we're not qualifying and does U.S. soccer take this seriously, like you you do need to question a little bit. Like, are you guys taking this seriously? Like, especially when you look at this qualification cycle and who they put in charge for it, you do you do wonder like was this even a priority for you? Like, do you guys see this as just not an important step? In the process, and, and maybe they don't right now, just given the makeup of the full men's team and how young they are there. I feel like, th- yeah, I feel like it's hard to argue that they don't, that they don't. I, I think they actually do ultimately rate it. Maybe I, I think the execution is maybe not the best, but I mean, I feel like the whole buzz was like, we're bringing in Jason Christ, and this is his sole mission. Um, now, was that the guy for the job? That's another question. But, like, I feel like there was this emphasis from U.S. soccer of, like, hey, we're going to put this known commodity in charge, and, and we're going to do it. Um, but but ultimately, like, the execution. And I, I think that the the performance of this team – during the tournament was almost a microcosm of it all where it's like, okay, again, we, and we can, we can dive into like the roster and like who, who was called in and, and the decisions over one player or another and, and you know, how they didn't obviously have access to like the elite of all, of what would qualify as like an under 23 player. Like this, the team played in a very, often sloppy and uninspired manner through stretches of the tournament. And it, and it ultimately, you know, it ultimately cost them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you watch this team, it was hard to argue that they were playing good, you know, cohesive dominant soccer. Um, And look, I, I hear your point. Like, I think they did, you know, say like, Hey, Jason Christ, we're bringing him in to, to, get this job done. But you also have to look a little bit like at Jason Christ and a little bit like at what this tournament is meant to do in the first place as a federational like goal. And I look at Jason Christ and his track record as a coach 
you know, he had success at RSL where he had a really good uh, GM who once that GM left, he he suddenly lost all of his mojo. Uh, he went to Orlando and was an unequivocal disaster there. And in neither of those locations did he have a squad that was chock full of youth players or young players that were bursting onto the scene. They were teams that were composed of veterans for the most part, uh, particularly in, in uh, Salt Lake. But they, they didn't really have anyone that was like young and, and, and impressive when he was in Orlando either. So it was just an odd choice to ch- bring in a guy that just doesn't have a track record of success with young players. But I think too, and I mentioned this at the beginning, I, I like the idea of this is, this is a developmental tournament, right? Like it's under 23 yeah. for a reason. You're, you're, it's not the full men's team because you're working that towards the world cup. And, and, and right. that should be where you're trying to prime your full men's team for. Why aren't we doing the same thing with this tournament that we do with players with, with coaches, like Jason Christ is a guy who's had his shot and he's had several MLS jobs and he's not gotten the full men's job. And it was almost like they gave him this as like a, a token, like, yeah, well we passed you over. for right? Yeah. And <clears throat> I would rather it be like a, a young and up and coming coach. Like I'm, sh- there's gotta be someone who's working with some of the youth national teams that we can pull up out of their, you know, the position and, and let them have an opportunity to guide these younger players and have that same type of hunger. And I'm not necessarily saying like a Jason Christ doesn't have hunger because that's unfair. But I, I do think that this is a ground for producing talent. And why aren't, why aren't we doing that with coaches the same way we are with players? And I think given a, a guy who's not got a good track record, those type of reigns just seems mm, uh, short-sighted and, and and on top of that probably the wrong choice overall i mean th- these are generally kind of one and done pass, pass fail gigs though right so like the logical thought is he'll be out pretty shortly on that gig and they'll be once again looking for that person that can get this squad or the just the federation uh, on the men's side, uh, you know, over the hump of, of getting back into the Olympics. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, who, I mean, is there somebody, I mean, do you have like names in mind or is it just, is it just USSF doing their due diligence of combing uh, just kind of the, the lower ranks and the, the developmental ranks within U.S. soccer? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we just, I don't, I don't have a name in mind. I'm not like, hey, this coach, like it should be the one that should have been guiding this. I'm more thinking of it as just the grooming process. Like, hey, we're grooming these players. We should be doing the same thing with our coaching staffs. Like after we're done with, with Greg Berhalter, wouldn't it be great if we had some sort of like pipeline of like coaches that we could cherry pick out and, you know, they're all used to the same system and the same set up and you know hey we can just roll with you know a coaching change isn't so devastating and i I think england did right yeah that that was exactly the example i was going to utilize is what gareth southgate did with with england he was the he started off in the youth ranks moved up and into the under 23 position and then begrudgingly took on the the full men's job at a time where no one, no one really wanted it and but he was prepared and all the players were used to playing for him and there was some familiarity and it, i think that was a, a large part of the success is he was able to get them to to bind in because they already right. were used to him and his ethos so it was it was good timing for that hire because that next it was time for the passing of the torch for that next generation right. uh, of English player to kind of take over the national team. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that's an idyllic situation that England had there. And I know it's not always going to work out in that circumstance, but you'd love to see some sort of effort to, to do that. And Jason Christ didn't ever scream that to me. Now we, we were talking about like how big of an issue it is with his coaching job. I don't think we need to overanalyze like, how poorly they they played but i do think it's also worth considering like this isn't entirely crisis fault it's not entirely u.s soccer's fault like 
Olympic qualifying is this weird duck on its own adding COVID to the situation. It makes it even weirder, but like federations are hamstrung by the fact that they can't, they can't like call in the players they want all the time for Olympic qualifying. Like teams are not obligated under FIFA rules to release for youth internationals. So because of that, you know, players like, you know, some of the top under 23 talent that we have out there just wasn't, a, wasn't available for selection. I mean, yeah, obviously the, the, all the, all the big names, really, if you think about it in U S soccer right now, all technically fit in that age bracket, right? Pulisic, yeah. Geo, like all those guys, uh, yeah, yeah. Hoppy, they, you were, you were talking about uh, a minute ago who you, who uh, we have an interview about, um, in a few minutes, like those guys, these big, the big up and coming names that instead were for the most part, all, you know, playing against Northern Ireland that day, you know, friendly, like those were the guys you preferably want to see. And those were the guys that I, I, and I don't know how the rules worked. Like technically those guys would have more than likely some of them been put on that Olympic squad had they qualified. Right. Yeah, and you you would expect a couple of the bigger names likely would have been parachuted in for experience's sake, if nothing else. Um, Although you you could also hear the argument like, hey, don't do that. Like, let the guys who earned their place there play in that tournament. Um, And and two, they, you know, that would be an extra burden for some of these players to carry in addition to the the roles they will undoubtedly play for the full men's national team in between now and then, and and potentially during that time as well. So it's a, it's a lot, it's a lot to take on. Um, And, you know, given that the the clubs aren't required to release them, that, that complicates things more than it would with, with traditional national teams and and full men's teams uh, in, in a way that it's just, it's not, uh, is easy to get a squad that you would potentially have at your disposal if it was just a, a, a typical national team call up. So I, I'm I'm slightly sympathetic to them there, but I also look up and down that roster and and you mentioned like there are a lot of names in that under 23 squad that I know and that I'm I've watched and not just in small amounts but in, in routine and regular amounts. You have to you have to just feel like. There's no reason that they shouldn't have qualified. Right. I mean, I, I, from my knowledge, and again, not every player was very known to me as far as their ceiling or, or what their trajectory currently was or where were they were even at as far as their path. But, like, to me, there was still enough talent on that roster that not qualifying was pretty unacceptable. Yeah. Like there, there wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, man, they just, oh, we just couldn't, you know, we just didn't have a good, good group, just didn't have the talent, didn't have the the players there. Like, no, like you have some really great players. You got guys like, um, you know, uh, Soto, who I, I still, I, I still put down, um, you know, I, I'm going all in on him. I still think he's, he's probably going to be one of our, our better options over the next five years at, at that strike position. Um, you, so you, you had the guys there that, that I, I don't think that was the issue, but um, you know, it was the execution. It just didn't get done. Right. Uh, was that Jason Christ just not getting the game plan or getting the players uh, believing or in the right setup or whatever to do it. Um and we can you can debate that stuff forever. I do. I think what I find the most egregious, though, out of all of this, and it's like, yeah, it's a bummer we didn't qualify. Yeah, we need to maybe rethink some of our process at that U23 level. And we talked about it. You know, maybe it's we look for a different type of coach that can handle that situation a little better. Maybe we effort more to get certain players or get the right players or really focus on, on, on more like a core group that you can rely on, something like that. Um, but within all of that and, and with all of the fallout of it came the super predictable, uh, this is a referendum on pay, pay to play 
crowd that shows and it's you know and 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 so they show up and it's like guys and, and it's it's just like the pro rel crowd in fact i'm pretty sure a venn diagram of those two crowds is just one circle mm. uh, but they they do the same thing you and i are both ideally would love pro rel in, in the us it would be a cool thing to have uh, at, one, at some point in time, it will make a lot more sense. Um, we we also both probably think that the way youth soccer is done in this country um, has some things that need to be fixed. Um, but, but so we're we're for those things. But when you get these groups, they come in. It's like <laughs> if we it, like this was the reason. This was the thing. And and dang it, if we just would have had pay to play figured out, and, and you know, kind of removed from the overall structure of American soccer, well, then I guess you know Ochoa doesn't make that mistake there and uh, and just you know give up that goal. I guess like I I just the whole like this is a whole like this loss, this not qualifying as a referendum on the entire structure of American soccer, it was just just such an asinine talking yeah point well and i hate i hate when they you know one or two things get the get the blame for the entire situation when it's very clearly far more complex than that um you know you see those those same people rally up and and talk about now is the time for the revolution and it's kind of like look like the time for the revolution has been like for the last 20 years. Like I, I think everyone's in agreement that like a lot of things need to get blown up, but like, let's not pin like this on, on that one thing specifically. Like yeah. we have, we had plenty of players who, who have a background in competitive soccer that should have led them to a better outcome than this. And it it is mega frustrating and it's embarrassing and it's a further sign of just the the tumultuous unorganized nature of our federation right now like i i think like it just this just further underlines the the larger issues and some of those are ones that overlap with the things that people like to complain about in the immediate aftermath of these type of results yeah <clears throat> but at the same time like you, you can't blow it all up at once. Like it's, it's literally impossible to do. Um, things are changing in the background and people refuse to acknowledge like whenever anything is changing. And I, I'm not sitting here saying like, be satisfied with what's going down and, and don't demand more, but it's also like, be realistic about what, what is solvable, what is actually at fault. And, the timelines that's necessary to correct these things. Like if we ended pay to play a month before the Olympics or Olympic qualifying tournament, like it, that wouldn't have changed the outcome of, of this Olympic qualifying tournament. You know right. what I mean? Like that's a generational thing that will take a decade to play out and, and be a benefit. So it's just, I agree with you. It's those, those knee knee jerk hot take reactions. Well, yeah, it's, it's those two camps, you know, it, it, on the club side of things, Anytime there is some, you know, something MLS does that people don't like or there's a, a lower league club that folds or there's, uh, you know, a, an independent league that, that had to merge or fold or something like that. Anything like that. Anytime those things happen, it's always a, well, well, you know, if we had pro rail, this wouldn't be an issue. And then on this side of things, anytime it's when it comes to the U.S. national team development again only on the men's side by the way that this argument comes up uh that uh, anytime anything like this happens where we don't qualify for the olympics or the national team just has a really bad stretch it's immediately well if we just had no pay to play and if we just had a completely different structure to youth development this would never happen and it's like yeah, I, those are two things that would ultimately be of a great benefit or, you know, change things up or make things better. But, like, you know, as I said, like, the keeper making some bad 
some bad plays there and allowing some goals. Like that was just two moments that happened. Like that's not, those moments didn't happen solely because uh, his parents had to fork out cash for him to play youth soccer. Like that's, that's not how this works guys. Like you just took just uh, a, a moment happened and you said, well, it's the entire big issue. That's that's the blame here. It's like, no, it's just that was just a bad moment. <laughs> well, hey, America's favorite pastime right now is definitely false equivalence. So uh, that's hard, hardly <laughs> that's uh, roll. Uh, a, su- a surprise uh, that we would be doing the same type of thing in the world of soccer. Uh, let's let's take a little break from the U23 discussion itself and the disappointment that we're feeling about that and talk a little bit about some of the brighter aspects of the youth national team program right now. I mentioned earlier uh, that we have a guest on this week and we'll take a moment to welcome him into the show. I had a a chance to talk to him a little bit earlier on uh, today uh, about uh, uh, the development of one of the key players uh, that's going on uh, in our national team setup right now. All right, joining me now on the show is a special guest coming all the way over from Germany. I have a member of the Schalke Under-23 coaching staff, Kai Hesse. Kai, thanks for joining us on the show today. Oh, thanks for the invitation. Nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So, Kai, you are a Schalke Academy coach. You work with the Under-23s. Talk to me a little bit about your current role and what you do within the club. Well, um, I came uh, to the club um, yeah, like six months ago from uh, Eintracht Frankfurt, uh, from the Youth Academy of Eintracht Frankfurt. I trained there with the under-17 team. And my, my role is uh, the assistant coach uh, of the under-23 team. Um, it's not just the assistant coach, it's also I'm head of the analysis. So um, basically... It's the opponent analysis, the own uh, analysis of our games, uh, the recap of our games. Um, also, I'm on the pitch with the team, with the other trainers. So um, um, many, many um, uh, things on my list to do. To do, but uh, it's 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 uh, for me it's a dream to uh, work in football. You know, I've been a player for 15 years and and. Um, it's it's absolutely a blessing to to work to work uh, in in football after my my player career, and it's it's only fun also to to be at a great club like Schalke here. Yeah, now you mentioned that you were a player yourself, uh, and you've moved into the coaching ranks as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience coming through the academy at Schalke? You you actually played as a youth player at Schalke as well. Yeah, I came to Schalke at the age of 16, so as a very, very young player to the under-17 team. And um, in my first year, I was driving all the way to training every day. It was like an hour drive. <clears throat> so um, I had my own driver at that point, but it, it was very, very much time we, we had to spend on, on the driving and my, my um, I wasn't, I wasn't that good in school at that point because I missed very, very many classes because I also played with the national team. And after one year, we decided with my family, with the trainers and the directors of the academy, that it would be better to, to move to Schalke, to the, um, yeah, to the academy, to get a room there, to live there permanently and to go to school also in Gelsenkirchen. And that was... Um, that was a really, really good decision because I, I could make my, my Abitur at that point. I don't know, it's, it's like high school, uh, mm-hmm. finishing high school, I think, something like that. So I, 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 um, I was able to go to university after that. And also I um, signed my first contract as a professional football player in, in Schalke 04. So it was a win-win situation for the, for the club because they, they got a, a good youth player, but also for me because... I was well educated in football as in life or in school. Very interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, it's been a few years since you came through that system. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the differences between the academy that you came through versus the academy that you now coach in? It's still all about football, but there are there are many differences. Yeah, I think the main difference or the the, yeah, the main difference is 
that it uh, that it's uh, that it's now much more professional than in the days when I was a youth player. You know, they have we we have like uh, psychologists, we have um, people who are 24/7 there for, for the guys if they have some problems. They have training uh, every day, sometimes two times a day training. They have great facilities. They have uh, great housings, um, and it, it, it also it just it, it wasn't an evolution, but it was just a development. Like every youth academy in Germany was developing in the last 15 years, and also Schalke did. We we spent a lot of money on the infrastructure, also to get the good players, the good youth players to our club, <clears throat> and to develop them to be professional football players at one at one uh, time in, in their life. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously things have improved, but I'm sure you had a, a great experience playing uh, for Schalke. Um, what, what would you say your, your best memory was from your time playing with the team? Oh, if I look back, it's overall, a, I had a really good time. I had a really good time because I was doing what I loved to do when I was a child. I was playing football all day long. Of course, I had school in the morning, but after school, everything was about football. And um, we had great success in, in, in the youth. In 2001, we were German championship with the under-17. We won the German championship with the under-17 team. And that was a huge, huge uh, success. And um, we had a goalkeeper at that point. I don't know, maybe you know his name. It was Manuel Neuer. <laughs> yeah. So um, we had really good players at that point. Some made it to the Bundesliga, and um, it was a really special team. We had a special spirit. We had a really good coach, who is now our head scout of the scouting uh, for our under thirty three team. So it's like a circle for me to come back to the club because now it's closed, and and I, I met so many faces I knew from my past. So it was really like a little bit of coming home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, what what made you decide specifically to come back to Schalke? You had mentioned that you'd been, I think you'd mentioned it at Frankfurt before. Um, you know, why why come back to Schalke and, and why coach uh, after you were done playing to begin with? Um, okay, that's... Uh, kind of two questions in one, so I will sure, start yeah. with why, why I why I wanted to be coach um, when I or when I was in the in the last terms of my football career. I decided, okay, what to do when I can't play anymore because, like for every football player, some someday it's it's over uh, mm -hmm. to play football, and then you have to do something else in the rest of your life. So I was uh, studying sport management, um, then I finished that, then I was studying. Uh, business psychology and psychology because I didn't know exactly if I wanted to be a coach or if I wanted to go to into business and um, I worked then at a firm for, for a year when I was a player but it was in, in, a, in, a, in a bureau uh, with, with my colleagues there and it had nothing to do with football it was about beauty something about beauty women beauty was really a, a interesting view for me because it was something something else than football but it wasn't something for me so at that point i decided no oh, it would be nice to stay in football because this is what i love to do this is where i'm good at and then i kind of started my coaching career uh, as an assistant coach uh, when i was playing but then i i, I ended my career and I started at antra Frankfurt at the youth academy with the under 17 team and it was very quick when I when I realized that this is really something I love to do. I love to 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 educate uh, young players, not only as players but also as people. Because um, you can be the best best football player on earth, but for me as a coach, it's also important to be a good a good teammate, like a good person, uh, and. In my in my role I have right now, it's 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 um, it's very easy for me to to influence uh, young people on their way, uh, hopefully to the top, and um, that's that's for me also very very satisfying. Yeah, very, very satisfying job I, I can do. 
Yeah. So, you know, th that's how you became a coach. Now you, you mentioned Eintracht Frankfurt and you've now returned to Schalke. What was the, the motivation to return to your old club? Um, the manager of the under 23 team is Gerard Azamor and um, we played in the first team for Schalke 04 and so we knew each other and um, they, they were searching for an uh, assistant coach analysis for the under 23 team and my name came up on the list and I had some, some good talks with uh, Peter Knebel who was head of Knappenschmiede at that point and Gerard Azamor, the under 23 manager. And um, for me, it was the next step, you know, I, I love to, to, to train with the uh, youth players, like under, under 17, I was for half a year the assistant coach of the under 13 team. But um, I realized that I want to train with, with uh, adults, with, uh, with men. And Schalke offered me uh, my next step in, in Frankfurt. There was no under 20, 23 club. And a uh, team, sorry, team. And Schalke offered me this 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 role uh, I have now, and for me it was just a step step forward in my career. And uh, also, of course, I played I played for this club for five years. Um, I had my my first experiences as a professional football play player at that club. And another thing is my family. My whole family lives like seventy kilometers away from here, so. It, for me, it's just a 45 minutes drive to them, so I can see them much more often than when I, when I lived in Frankfurt or all, all over um, uh, Germany. So there were so many aspects for this, for this change that were, that were good, that for me, it was just a big deal. And um, after our first uh, uh, talk, I knew I wanted to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so tell me just a little bit about the, the setup at Schalke and, and the academy progress to the first team. Um, is that something, you know, the, the number of teams that we see or, or, you know, how many players are we, we talking about that are moving through the system that may make it up to that level? We have teams in our academy from the under-8 team to the under-23 team and with a professional as the main team. And... Uh, so we have like with the under 10 or under 8, under, under 8, under 9, under 10, there are not that many players, but from the, I think under 13, under 14, there are like 20, 22 players in every team. So we have a, a huge amount of, 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 of players, of re really talented players. But um, of course, it's, it's the process is um, you, will, you, will, you, will, uh, you will go up, Every year, from the under eight to under nine, from under nine to under ten, every year, every year the same. The best best players will go up. Some have to look for other clubs. That's just a normal normal thing uh, in academies and the top academies in Germany. But like, if you if you see the players who came up to the to the first team in the last years here, they all have the similar ways. Just go up every year, every year. Uh, um, um, what do you say it? Um, be better at what you do, learn as much as you can, and uh, then good things will happen to you. But it's, it's of course, a huge a lot of, uh, amount of, of, of work you have to put in there, also at a young age. So uh, I know it myself. I was at the same position as the players that are now in our system right now. And um, it's, not, it's not sunshine every day. You know, when I came to, to Schalke, there were also some bad days where I wanted to go home to my family back again, but you have to go through those, those dark days as well if you want to shine one day. And um, I think the Academy of Schalke Mofi is one of the best in Germany. We have very, very talented players in every team. And there, there will be in the future, there will be uh, uh, many players like in the past, like in the past that will, that will make their way uh, into the professional football. So you talked about, you know, some of the things that you're looking for for those players to improve year on year to progress into the, the squad and potentially into that first team. What type of traits and characteristics are you looking for as a U23 coach to, to have a player be successful at that level? Um, yeah, as my role is the assistant coach of the under 23, but... I think it's it's like every every coach is looking for 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 similar things. You know, it's like 
first contact or striker? Is he, how is his behavior in front of the goal uh, for a defender? How is he defending? How is he in, in one against one situation? So it's like the whole picture. We, we try to paint the whole picture of players, of course. Or, 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 um, of course, it's, it's always, if you have strengths, try to, try to strengthen your strengths. If you have weaknesses, try to, try to weaken your weaknesses. And this is like, if I can, can, can describe, or if I would describe my work, it's something about that. The players will give me something about, about them, just when I, when, I, when I look at them, how they train, how they behave, and I will figure out how to, to improve their way of playing, how they will fit into a system. But in the youth, in the, in the, in the younger ages, it's all about playing football. They have to have fun at, at, at work. It's not work for them. It's just their free time. They want to have fun in that time. They want to play, play, play. One against one situations, play, play, play. It's nothing about tactics or something. Like this. this is something that comes later when they are older. Of course, it's, football has developed in the past. So tactic is a, is a, is a huge, huge uh, asset you have, to, you have to have in your uh your not suitcase but you know you know what i mean okay yeah, yeah, yeah. um and we have we have plans at the academy at which, at which age the players need to need to have this or that uh, uh, skill yeah. and we will develop this with them um so one of the challenges i'm sure that you guys face with especially as players get into the u23 ranks is, is foreign players. And we'll use this as a kind of good transition point to talk a little bit about a, a player like a Matthew Hoppy, uh, who is a, a young American striker who's made his mark now within the first team at Schalke. Um, you know, what, what do you guys do to help players who may not be as familiar with, with German systems uh, and, and German academies? How do you help them acclimate to, those, uh, to, to the team? Um, young players from 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 uh, other countries normally come to uh, families families who are sometimes Schalke fans uh, or, or like really often are Schalke fans. They they treat these these players like their own child. So it's it's it has many many uh, uh, um, um, possibilities what's the word right. advantages mm -hmm. for the players and also for the club because they will be integrated much much uh, efficiency or much 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 uh, faster uh, than if they uh, would be on their own they they have a family they can talk to a family that maybe senses if if they're not doing well right now they have just just uh, another family they, of course they have their family in the, in the foreign country, but but they have they 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 win another family, and we have really good good people who are giving hundred percent to make it as easy for the foreign players to acclimate to Germany uh, as fast as possible. Because everybody knows that maybe if there's a, a language barrier or something, it's really hard for for uh, a, a really young, not, let's not talk about player, just a, a young person to, to leave the family behind, to come to a whole different uh, country and then focusing on, on, on football. So of course uh, we, we try to help them and uh, also we give them like German, German lessons so, so that, that there's this language barrier I was talking about. Maybe it's a little bit easier for them to get into contact with the people at school or also talk with the family or talk with the teammates to get better integrated into the team as well. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about Matthew Hoppe himself um, and his progress within the Schalke Academy. Obviously he, he started his youth career over here in the U S uh, with LA galaxy. It was the last youth club before he moved over to Schalke. Um, why do you guys feel like he was a player who was successful within the, the Schalke setup and, and why he's been able to progress into the first team? Um, you know, the, the progress of every player is different. Every player has his own, own progress. Matthew was one of the players who needed some more time after his under 19th uh, uh, year in, in Schalke. Um, we gave him that time with the under 23 team 
uh, he played game with, games with us, he made goals for us, and uh, you can see that he has uh, some really, really good qualities. And um, as, I, as I said to, to every player that's, that, that, that I trained in the last two years, if you have a chance in professional football, you have to be there and take that chance because as a young player, maybe you get another chance. Maybe, maybe you get a third chance, but normally you get one chance and then it's not ride or die, but you have to be there and, and take it. And Matthew is, is maybe the best example in the last years in, 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 the, in the Bundesliga for a young player who had a chance and who took the chance with a good, good, good training um, at our team, good training with the first team when he, when he had the chance to go up because some strikers were injured, injured there. And then with a good, good uh, games, he, he played for the first team and also with the goals he played, uh, he, he made. And now he's, uh, he's a member of the first team and made his dream come true to be a professional, really professional football player in the first, first league at a really big club in Germany. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, is there potentially a player that you've played with or that you've worked with in the past that you think uh, Matthew might be a, a, a player you can compare him to? Oh, that's a good question. Let me think about it for a moment. Um, I think every player is, 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 a, is a known player, like uh, you say, it's known character. So I, I don't think comparison is something that's uh, that good also when you talk about, about young players. I can say that Matthew has a really strong will to, to work. I was with him after training uh, when we did some one against one, some shootings. He always asked, can we do some, some shootings? Can we do this? Can we do that? And I was uh, really happy, happy to help him. Uh, with with some things or spend time with him because he's like really a cool guy also to hang out with uh, on the pitch and he's he's really fun he's this American open open mind and I like talking to him I like working with him and he has like um, what's what's the word he 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 can he can run like <laughs> he can run two day, two games in a row <laughs> so this is like qualities we are talking about. Of course, if you can run, run much, it's not that big quality. But for the game, or how the game is played right now in the last years, you have to run that much. You have to run in a very high speed uh, kilometers uh, over, overall in the game. And this is something um, Matthew can do. And um, also in front of the goal, he's, he's really good. He, 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 I don't know if you, if, if you can... Uh, uh, translate it into into uh, American like this. He's, he's cold as a as a as a dog uh, 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 mouth or something like this. But I don't know if, if that's a <laughs> sentence in in, uh, in America. No, I, I think I can follow. I think I can follow. Um, well, I, you know, we're we're curious. You know, we've seen him be successful. You guys have seen him be successful within the youth ranks and now into the first team. What do you think a player like Matthew Hoppy needs to continue doing? And what elements of his game do you think he needs to continue working on to see his game continue progressing and to become a better striker? Uh, as every young player, I think it's, it's the most important thing that, um, that he gets time, time of play, playing time. And um, of course, if you, if you watch the games, there are some things that he could have, could have done a little bit better maybe if it comes to first contact or, or uh, uh, passes or something like this. But Matthew has, has really good um, ground put, uh, potential, potential. And if he, if he keeps, keeps working hard, and I know he will, he, he with his will and, um, what's the word, um, air guides. Uh, Determination. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, determination. Yes, it's it's uh, it's. Uh, I think he will he will make make his way. He will make his way. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I would imagine you know with a, a good striking teacher such as a, a Kai Hesse guiding the way and providing <laughs> analysis and inputs, uh, I'm sure he'll get uh, an extra quick rise up the ranks. 
Uh, right now, he's just with the first team, so my, my job has nothing to do with the first team. He was my player with the under-23, but um, if, I can, if I just helped him like 1% or 2% on his way, this is, that would be high, you know. It is not sure. because I was, I was shooting with him after the training, but maybe I, I got him a little bit of input for this, a little bit of input for that, um, that he thought about and maybe changed a little bit about his game. But um, we, we, we trainers uh, can all, only open the door. It's, it's the player who walks through it. And Matthew did it in an excellent way, but uh, now uh, it's, he's a player for the, for the first team. And, he has to make his way there. He gets help there. And I'm happy that I coached him. And I'm happy of the way he did. But, um, of course, it's not the end of his way. Uh, he has to work hard to, 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 to get the playing time he got before and to score maybe uh, more goals in the future. Yeah. And, and you'll, I'm sure, be training strikers behind him to help keep the pressure on him. And... Uh, continue pushing him from from that way as well yeah of course of course we have we have uh, with our team uh, one older guy but also another one who's, who's very talented and, and that's the way we get from the under 19 we get in the for the next year very talented young strikers we are looking for one strikers uh, uh, in in at, for at the other teams like like our scouting team so that's the normal cycle of, of football. Every year for an under-23 team, the, the name changes, the faces changes, but the overall message, message is still the same. We want to uh, develop players. We want to uh, uh, give them a helping hand on their way and maybe on the way that's leading to professional football. Excellent. Well, Kai, thank you so much for your time and inputs and your, your efforts uh, over in Germany to develop the players that we all get to watch and enjoy uh, each weekend. Um, really been a, a pleasure talking with you and uh, best of luck continuing to work with the, the players uh, over there in the future. Thank you very much. It was also a pleasure for me to be on your podcast and um, all the best for you and the future. Excellent. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay, well, let's go back to uh, you know where where I guess we're already in Europe here talking uh, about uh, development in, in the Bundesliga. Um, let let's stay there. Let's go to the Premier League, our bread and butter. We're we're into the final stretch coming up this weekend. Uh, most teams have anywhere from eight to ten matches left. Um, this is kind of you know this is kind of that last big run for teams to. Uh, to kind of eat, you know, salvage their season, to uh, supplant themselves in, you know, a European spot, uh, to to win the league if you're Manchester City, or, or to not get relegated, or you know, not run out of gas and completely tank the season. So we're gonna look ahead to these final matches, this final stretch here, and just kind of let's talk about some of those main things let's start with relegation it it would appear that West Brom and Sheffield United are sort of already got the one foot out the proverbial door yeah I mean we've been saying that about about the blades for pretty much the entirety of the season given no. how poor their form has been four wins on the season it just seems highly unlikely that they're going to find a way to make up the, the existing 14 point gap that sits in without front of a manager. Yeah. Uh, so they're, they're down West Brom, even with big Sam in chomping his way up on his, uh, on the touchline over there. It's just, I don't know that they've got the players within that squad necessarily to, to dig themselves out of their hole. So yeah, I, I kind of agree. I think they're both mo more than likely down. Um, what it really becomes is then who fills that last hole. And there are some names that you would expect in that equation and some that you probably wouldn't expect to be in that equation. And it extends surprisingly far up the table. Like if you think about it, like, yeah, you've got Fulham and Newcastle who are kind of like in a two point dead heat and, and kind of the furthest back right now. Um, but 
even someone like Wolves, who have 35 points, like that's only a seven point slip. Uh, and, and they would find themselves in a really difficult situation. And given the, the chaotic nature of the Premier League this season, like you look at Southampton, like who f- were flying high for like the first two months of the campaign, they, they've only won one out of their last five matches and they've lost yeah. the other four. Like they, um... they could find themselves in, in the shitter here pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I was surprised by that when I was looking down, like at the like the lower end of the table. Where again, you see, you got Fulham and Newcastle are. Out, I mean, they are in the thick of the fight. Um, to to for that last to not not be in that last spot. But I, I was shocked that like Wolves, Southampton, and Villa, or I said Wolves and Southampton, and then you know, like Crystal Palace is right around there. Like that, all these teams, and especially like Wolves and Southampton, like had great promising moments in the season, and, and like. They're they're inside of ten points of being in some real danger. Yeah. Um, but if you look at it like, and we always have these like striations with the Premier League, right? Where they're like your relegation candidates and your middle of your tables and your European contenders and your Champions League places, and even within those ranks this year, like it's been it's been really up and down. Like no one has been like the the key driver for any length of time in any of those segments of the table. Mostly people have stayed within their, their segments, but within those ranks, like people have been very topsy and turvy. And I feel like that's exactly what we're seeing in the, this bottom half of the table now is like everyone is kind of capable of anything. And as a result, like anything could unfold. And it, it may seem wild to be talking about wolves up in 13th place, you know, who are currently seven points above the fold, maybe being in a relegation battle, but that seven points isn't much, especially with how this Premier League season is going. I, I obviously, I, I think it still will just come down to Fulham or Newcastle. Um, it, interesting point. The here is between the two of them. They only have a combined five wins in 2021. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, so they're not, not trending in the right direction. No. Um, and then, and I think it's it's setting up great. Fulham and Newcastle actually do play each other on Championship Sunday. Oh, delicious. We could have, like, the big six-pointer loser, loser leaves town. Uh, uh final match of the season between those two knowing how it normally goes with Newcastle like they'll assure us a relegation like for themselves like several weeks beforehand and then they'll blow full amount in that last match at a point where like it doesn't matter any longer <laughs> probably let's talk about teams that are going to hopefully salvage their season and teams that may have run out of gas going to the teams that will run out of gas like I think Southampton and Wolves are on that list. Um, oh, sure. I think these are two teams that it's it's shock. You, you've kind of already said it, like it's shocking where they find themselves right now, and the fact that like where they find themselves make it pretty much almost you know unless they can somehow get things going in a big way, like that big season that they looked like they were gonna have, where they were gonna compete for a European spot and finish inside the top 10 and, and like finishing inside the top 10 almost seemed like a slam dunk at points for both of those sides. Um, instead it's, it's them like treading water to make sure they are not actually in a real relegation bout come May. Yeah. It really makes you wonder whether our calls for them progressing as a club were a bit premature. Right. And it wasn't long ago that Ralph Hassenhodel was like the the darling next big guy to get sucked away by one of the big clubs um, out there, and that his star has certainly fallen as they've slipped. And you do you do have to question like maybe this really nice run of form they had was actually just the anomaly. Like they mm-hmm. hadn't actually improved; they just had found a heater of a run of form, and then once that cooled off. 
like the actual Southampton and Wolves have kind of crept back out into the equation. But yeah, man, those are those are two as far as sides in the in the mid table and as far as the expectations that we had for them. I think those are the two that embody that kind of cool off the best. Um, you know, if you look higher up the table, though, there, there's plenty of those type of candidates there as well. Like Liverpool and Everton, like, yeah, you know, they're they're both sitting neck and neck in the table itself. But they both have the feeling of sides that like have kind of like we've seen the best that we're going to see of those two teams so far this year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quickly going back to Wolves, like, how much does uh, Raul Jimenez being knocked out for the season, essentially, like, how much did that kind of hurt them? Oh, it's huge. I mean, given his prominence within that squad over the last few years, it, I don't think that can really be underestimated this year. And uh, it, it's great news to see that he's back and training with the first team and may get some minutes, um, you know, before the season's all said and done. But, you know, here's hoping that he just makes it back to being that type of player and that they can actually lean him on him in that way again in the future. Um, All right. We can kind of just go ping back and forth with just guys we have on our list. Um, For teams that I think are going to find a way to salvage their season, I put Arsenal on that one. Ooh. I, this is exactly what Arsenal does, right? Like when it, when it kind of already when when things of merit are out of reach, they go ahead and they're like just start playing great soccer and winning matches down the stretch. When they've already eliminated themselves from the big from the big prizes, they just they just start looking like, like all world. Oh, for sure. That they thrive the most when the spotlight is off of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, they they, but, they no. do this constantly, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, they're finding a little bit of a headwind at the moment. And, you know, they're they're certainly not one of the better teams in the Premier League this year. But what what do you consider a good rebound for them? Like, if, if they're saving themselves, is that Europa League? Like, I I think that's what, what they're staring at. Yeah, I mean, I think, sal- I th- well, I think salvaging it is... Yeah, I guess Europa is what would be, like, the easy play on that of, like that that salvaging the season you know to another extent and i think it also kind of ties into you know who may be running out of gas is like you know even if they only finish just in a run-of-the-mill top 10 side like who do they finish above do they finish above everton do they finish above spurs Uh, both of those would be seen as victories for them right like for as crap a year as they've had, if they can somehow find a way to finish above Spurs, which I, I go ahead and throw that out now. I have them in the possibly running out of gas category. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Like that's that's a W for them, right? Yeah, uh, I mean it's. I will tell you right now that their fans would certainly view vin- finishing above Spurs again finally as a, a massive. Thing, uh, you know, getting to celebrate St. Totteringham's Day uh, is something that they value for whatever reason uh, really highly. And I think emotionally, that's something that that club could use. But yeah, I mean, I, I think any of those three teams you mentioned finishing above them is accurate. But I, I would agree with you, like Spur, Spurs are one of those teams that kind of kind of feels like we've seen the, the best of, of this Mourinho side. And um, man. Uh, I'm I'm really hoping they don't finish below Arsenal. I, I think that would be like the last gut punch for the season that I could handle. That'd be it'd be pretty bad. Um, I you one one team I think that actually has a chance of really salvaging their season because I feel like there was a lot of negativity at stretches around this side, mm-hmm. but if you look at where they're at, there it's still a very salvageable season, and that's Crystal Palace. Yeah. You know, uh, old man Roy has basically like everyone's like write him off as like this guy is done, he's over with. But like, you know, they're in twelfth right now. They're not too far away from, I mean, finishing in the top ten, which for Crystal Palace side, that's a that's a good season, right? Like, that's mm-hmm. a good, a respectable season for them. Like that's super attainable at the moment. 
yeah, I mean, <clears throat> they certainly have it in front of them, and they they have the talent within their squad to to punch a little bit higher up in the table than where they currently find themselves. Sure. And yeah, I mean, I don't think they're going to be competing for European places, but I no. do think they can pull themselves up into the top half and and feel pretty good about themselves for the year. Um, let, let, let's talk about another side that I think is probably deserving of, you know, the float up praise Chelsea. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I have them. It's hard not to, I, I, I did not want to put them on my list, but it's like, yeah. I mean, they're riding such a heater right now. You're just like, I'm waiting for DJ to give me the go ahead. So this I'll feels fair. I'll, I'll be humble and let him say it. Yeah, exactly. But no, I mean, you know, since two shells arrived, you guys are a different squad. And yep. I know the heartbreak of, of losing dear Frank, uh, you know, has still got to sting to a certain extent. But there's no denying that Tuchel has them playing more beautiful football, uh, more organized football, and ultimately better. And their position in the table, sitting squarely in fourth and starting to put some distance between themselves and the opposition for those places is pretty promising. And I think you, you probably have to feel pretty good about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I wonder, it, you know, kind of where, where Tuchel came in at and how much of was left of the season and, you know, kind of the, the way the season's going to end for us with like a, a pretty, pretty tough stretch there at the end, as far as matches and, and us still being in, in multiple competitions. Um, I, I do wonder what our ceiling actually is. Like, what does that look like? Is that, is that just hanging on to fourth or could we actually even do better than that? Yeah. Um, and, and maybe I'm just kind of getting ahead of myself there, but like, how, how, okay, we're doing pretty well. How, how well can we do? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Uh, did you have any other on your list as far as like running out of gas or they can salvage the season? Now I'm, I'm waiting for Lester to run out of gas, but so far yeah, they, I think seem, they all are. Uh, so far they seem to have put enough. We're in all checking game. to watch. Yeah. I, I did. I did. Uh, I threw Villa on here. As well mm-hmm. as like running out of gas, like I feel like they were another side that was having some really good stretches early on, and now it's like, like okay, are you gonna finish in the top ten? Like, are you gonna are you gonna be a top ten side at the end of this? Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Remains to be seen. Yeah. Uh, um, anything else from the Premier League you want to touch on as uh, we wait for not- it to anxiously return? I cannot wait for it to return. I don't I, mean, I think we're playing like West Brom this week, and I cannot wait to watch that. Yeah. Not I'm, fun match. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward we, to Spurs letting me down once again. I'm sure that's just around the corner. It, fun times. Yeah. Uh, when, hey, when is your when's when's the cup final, right? When's that? When's Mourinho's time to shine and get you, you guys a trophy? When is that? Huh. Jeez, like, I, they I, put I, that at like the end of the year, right? Or the end yeah, of the season? I think, I think it's at the very end of the season. I I can't. I'll be honest, I almost forgot that they had qualified for that at this point. You guys in City, it'll be great. Um, right. Let's go stateside. Uh, I know we kind of already talked about the whole not qualifying for the Olympics, and obviously that was just kind of a big topic. But, um, you know, MLS season starts uh, in a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, three weeks from now? Um, the other, the actual... U.S. men's national team played some matches. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's a few little things to throw out here. We'll, we'll start with the the actual U.S. men's national team. Uh, they played uh, Jamaica um, in, like, didn't they play them, like, in, in... Austria? Austria, right? Okay. Yeah. And then they played Northern Ireland in Northern Ireland? Yeah, I think so. Or did they also play them? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, both were wins. Um, one more convincing than the other, but that's sure. to be expected as they were playing a Jamaica side that is sort of in this weird flux where they're bringing in all of these uh, who would otherwise qualify to be like English national team players, but who have uh, Jamaican uh, uh, ancestry or roots or family members within their within their family, so they qualify for that and 
the national team has been able to uh, swipe a couple of those guys uh, mm-hmm. recently. But then at the same time, they were also dealing just travel restriction and protocol and all that stuff. And they were like fielding like a keeper that could like barely make a USL side. So like it was kind of, it was a match where there wasn't a whole lot to really get too excited about. Sebastian Legette scored some goals. And then uh, Euro snobs freaked out. That was fun. Yeah, that was. Uh, I tweeted out like Legit hate is now the new Wando hate. Like oh, that's so good. Uh, it's exactly what it is, and everyone kind of despises that this MLS guy keeps getting call ups, and that Burhalter seems to value him so much. But he, weird thing is, dude just keeps converting when he when he gets his chances at the national team level. So it's it's hard to argue against his inclusion, but. No, I mean, if, if you look at both of the results, uh, you know, obviously the Jamaica match is what it is. But the, the Northern Ireland match, it's the first time the national team's ever won in the British Isles, like ever. Um, so, I mean, that alone is a, a good stat. But what we really got to see for the first time was more or less our full strength side. There were there's some pieces that were missing here and there, uh, you know, no Weston sure. McKinney at all. But we more or less got this shot of this dream youth movement team for the first time in both of these games. And yeah, there are some things that need to be worked on and yeah, there's some holes that need to be developed, but I don't, I mean, look, as, as frustrating and as disappointing as the under 23, uh, you know, debacle is you have to look at the men's national team and go, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not feeling too bad about that. We got some pieces to work with. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And there's still plenty of tests and challenges that lie ahead for them. Sure. Uh, And there's no, by no means like a guarantee for any sort of success, but these are all guys who are young enough to be playing for that under 23 team, Mm -hmm. but are actually like locking down positions in the full men's team now. And there, that's not a bad thing either. And these guys are going to get their opportunities uh, in, in the months to come, uh, you know, for things like the Gold Cup and, uh, you know, international competitions that will keep a lot of them busy for their club teams as well. So CONCACAF Nations League. Yeah. Uh, all, all, all all possession of, all of, uh, of, of club soccer. Um, we talked about positions. You talked about uh, guys that are exciting players that are just you know these these great big prospects that we can build around on the other side of that what are the positions that you feel are the least sorted out or like where there's just a clear like this is these are our these are our you know one or two options here like where where is it where there's still some real questions i think there's some easy question marks to like circle out there like Left back is still a question, although seeing how well Serginio Dest played over there instead of on his more typical right hand side, you know, if he can do that, then that might leave it up to to free up some of these other good outside backs that are sitting close to him in the pecking order, like an Anthony Robinson, you know, to to then go and have two good players playing on your wide flanks. Um, so th- that's, you know, you look at those and you want to go, hey, I'd love to have a more natural left back there. Um, but at the same time, I-, I think center back still is a little bit of a question mark. We have a couple guys in like Miazga or, um, you know, John Brooks, who seem to be consistently performing uh, at that level. But then, you know, if, if there's an injury or, you know, Brooks hasn't exactly been the healthiest guy, like if he slips up and, and can't play you know, then there become questions about who fills into that next spot. And, you know, Richards is, is probably the, the next answer there. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to see him be, you know, an automatic choice, but we don't, we don't know those answers yet. Um, and I think too, you look at that holding midfield role uh, that Weston McKinney normally plays in. And without him there, I think we were clearly lacking in that role uh, for both of these matches. So yeah, it, you know, then there's the very obvious one of like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had a world class striker too? Yeah, I was gonna uh, say like, if you're if you're making the lineup right now, like, 
who is your preferred pick up top at this moment? I'd probably go with Sargent. I think they, they don't play until like June 5th. So that, that yeah. June 5th match, the next one up, who you want to pencil in there? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of options that you could consider, but I, I think Sargent, given his form of late, is is probably that answer. I'd love to see Matthew Hoppy get a, a good look, um, you know, given what he's done in Germany this year with a Schalke team that has struggled at times. Um, you know, I, I think we have options to examine, which is really nice. Um, yeah. and so, Soto, I think, is deserving of a look, uh, too. Well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we could love to see him get in there as well. And I, I was actually hoping he was actually going to play a lot more over these these past two matches because I mean the dude's just playing so well right now in Barnsley that let's like you know play the hot hand. Oh, exactly. Let's see him, let's like, see him go out there and cause some problems. Yeah, um, you know, I'd I'd love to see DK get a, a run out there. So. Look, I, I think we've got some options available to us, which is different. Um, but yeah, I, I was actually that's I think the most surprising thing right now is like where we stand. Like, I feel like a year ago we were all like, I have no idea who we're playing up top, and now it's like, I mean, like, like four like really exciting options. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, it's it's good to see those type of developments happening, um, and it helps you feel a little bit better about what's going on at the Olympic level and the failures that are happening there. But uh, yeah, it was it was a good international break, at least as far as the full men's team was concerned, and uh, it, it allows us to then shift our attention to Major League Soccer, which is literally right around the corner. You're right, and the so schedule drop for for MLS full schedule. We had the like. Hey, here, here's everybody's home game. Uh, we'll get back to you uh, when the, you know, with the rest of it. But like, we had home openers. Now we have the full schedule. Um, like, I, we're three weeks away. How pumped are you? Like, where are you at? Like, are you at that point where you just you're ready for that domestic game to be here, or it's like, man, it's okay. I guess, I guess that's coming up. Yeah, I mean, we talked to last week a little bit about the exhaustion of, like, the constant soccer for, like, the last 11 months, it feels <laughs> like now. Um, I'm, I'm excited for it. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things to look forward to, some new grounds, mm-hmm. you know, new, new teams, new, you know, new big names and players, especially here in Cincinnati. Um, you know, I think I think there's a lot of things to be excited about. Um, I'm definitely feeling a little bit, a little bit of the fatigue uh, at the moment from from a watching standpoint. But I think like the newness of the season will, will certainly suck me in. And I think uh, given how much there's there is to look forward to and, and the the change that should be expected in MLS this year from a competitive standpoint for a lot of teams, I, I'm excited about it. I, I can't wait for it to get here. So, like, on most of the schedules, it's showing the Canadian teams are obviously going to be playing at temporary places. But, like, if you look, like, if you look at FC Cincinnati's schedule, like, their away games to uh, to uh, Toronto and uh, Montreal, I want to say, all, like, TBD. Like, we, it's a little weird that we are still in the situation where, like, there's multiple teams in the league that – we don't really know where they're actually going to be playing for most of the season. Yeah. Like at some point they're probably going to get home games, like actual home games. But like, when is that? How many is that? Is it all of them at once? Uh, You know, just like one of the province, like just go like, nah, we're still, (laughs) we're still locking down, but uh, you you hang out and wherever you're at there, uh, Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you'd expect anywhere to do it, maybe it'd be somewhere like Prince Edward Island, like have them all go to like a, a small little bubble there. Right. It's good. Yeah. Go to, or just go to like, it, and there's gotta be a field in Newfoundland where just where there's literally, uh, you know, like just some cows grazing like on the other side and, and they can just have an MLS match take place there. Sure. Why not? I can't wait. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I I think the other thing to throw out here, and, and I saw what Bruce Arena made some comments on this uh, yesterday, is like MLS always has like a, a you know kind of a long 
off season compared to most you know European leagues and stuff like that. But for teams that didn't make the playoffs, your FC Cincinnati types, uh, they last played a competitive regular season MLS match at my not only my favorite uh, indie rock band uh, from growing up, but also just when that last happened, and that would be early November. Uh, mm. They have not played since the early November, and I think like November eighth was the last time FC Cincinnati played a meaningful match. And now they will wait all the way till April 17th. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a long layoff. Um, and, How you know, rusty are these guys going to be? I mean, I, I think it's not going to be unlikely that we'll have injuries, uh, you know, early on in the season after these long layoffs. Um, I think we're going to see some inconsistency in performances. Uh, because some teams will maybe have erased a little bit of their uh, time off and, and, and sleepiness in, the, in play with maybe some earlier starts to preseason or more intense starts to preseason. Um, but I, I do expect this is going to be a little bit of a, a wild stretch for Major League Soccer is all these teams who've really been sitting down forever, uh, you know, even teams who played in MLS Cup, you know, they they're still having like a four month layoff. I mean that's a that's a really long time for for players to go before they're getting in matches. So yeah, I I, I fully expect that we're going to see a bit of a chaotic start to the season and and things will not necessarily go uh, the way that maybe some of the pundits would would predict. Uh, last little domestic note: uh, U.S. Open Cup made the, an announcement today that basically. We're not going to have that opening round of the tournament. We're going to have the tournament, unlike last year, but we're not going to have the opening round. Instead, um, eight MLS sides are going to be invited based off of their record at the beginning of the season. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, another another shining example of U.S. soccer just really not not convincing us all that they actually care about anything that they're doing. Well, it, yeah, the, the U.S. Open Cup has for years been in a weird spot where the MLS sides just don't really care about it. I mean, you, you literally had guys like Bruce Arena who would rather send, like, a high school team out there in L.A. Galaxy uniforms than actually have his players spend a moment thinking about the tournament. Right. Um you have like USL clubs, I think, take it the most seriously because it's this cool event where they get to go up against the you know the big dogs in MLS, and then they can actually you know they've been known to pull off a few victories in that. And then like the lower league clubs, it's a really cool event, but and especially right now where we're still in these. COVID times of not having attendance the way it should be. Um, it's also just, a, you know, for, for like an NPSL side or, or a USL, uh, USL two side, it, it's, it's, it's a it's kind of an expense. It's an extra expense that not all those clubs are super, uh, super excited to be a part of. And so you have this, that I, I think you just kind of have these competing minds, even at the lower level of like, this is a really cool thing. Hopefully we have the budget for it. Well, I mean, you know, and I just there'd be an easy solution for U.S. soccer. Just throw money at this thing. Give people prize yeah. money. Yeah. We'll literally, we'll literally change all the equation. Bigger prize. Uh, yeah. No, it, it, it would be pretty cool if they had the ability to do that. Um, it's frustrating, again, that the, the Open Cup is always this kind of ramshackled afterthought. Uh, of American soccer most years because I think it is something that should be a bigger deal than it is and should have, you know, I, I, we've talked about this a lot before. Uh, I don't know a, a real, uh, you know, TV contract, yeah. uh, or a rights contract that that makes it accessible, but at the same time is actually helping them make this a money maker for them, um, which I know is difficult because their MLS current TV contracts really aren't even money makers. So, yeah, why would the U.S. Open Cup be any different? Very true. Uh, 
we all look forward to the bastard version of uh, the Open Cup this season. Uh, I guess it's time to do winners and wankers. Let's do it. Winners and wankers. Already in that wanker assigning mode at this point. Why don't you give us your wanker for this week? Uh, I'm assuming it's not the one you just provided. Uh, no, no, it's it's not that one. Although I, I think it that was a contender there. Um, I feel like I'm stealing your spotlight because you're the you're the design guy. But uh, boy, that inner and that inner Milan rebrand sucks. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of that one at all. Um, I the, I think what they did is they saw what Juve did, and I think the initial backlash to the Juve one was was strong, but I think a lot of people have come around on it and have seen like, oh, they did a good job, and they I mean, they yeah, went I, I, anytime anytime you take a famous branding or logo. And try to go, hey, we're going to put a modern, we're going to redo this in a very modern way. Like, even it's a, if it's a really good, great-looking design, like the U of A one was, the shock value of the change, for especially for a lot of the loyal fans, like, it's it's so jarring Yeah. that they'll well, just hate it that way. But, you know, again, they'll warm up to it because it's a good design. The Inter Milan one, I, I don't think we're going to have that second part. No, I mean, that that's the thing, like the, the Juve one, like their old crest, you know, that oval one was like good, but it was like very 90s and it oh, felt very, very 90s and like their new one, you know, it may feel dated in another 10 years. We'll have to wait and see. But you're right. People came around to it because the design and the concept were good. The The issue with the inner one is like they already had a like classic timeless immediately recognizable crest it wasn't like juve who had a crest that like looked like it needed a refresh right inner had a crest that was like damn near perfect already and they ditched it for something that that you know they were trying to simplify you know what they were going for but they just screwed the pooch and i'm with you entirely it's not my wanker this week but uh yeah it sucked you're a wanker uh, yeah, my, my wanker, I'm going to give it to these national team associations, the the countries, the FAs, and their players. Uh, and there were some of these this week, uh, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, who are doing these kind of like pseudo protests against the Qatar World Cup uh, and human rights violations there. And German uh, player uh, Kimmich uh, said this this week. He said... These protests are like 10 years too late. And yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with like protesting them now. Like, I think it's a, it's good that something's being said. But like the issue that I have is like none of these teams are actually saying like, well, if we qualify, we're going to turn down our spot. Like no one's right. actually doing a protest here. And like all these teams will be just as happy to turn around and and fly to Qatar at this point. And like, I think everyone is in universal agreement outside of like people who had financial vested interests in this situation that the Qatar World Cup is the worst decision possible. But the, the, all these people are like pretending and like, uh, I feel like this is something that gets tossed around in defense of like, you know, or uh, opposition to wokeness. But like this whole idea of um, virtue signaling, like this is the ultimate example of virtue signaling. Like, yeah, it's good that you're making a stand against this, but you're not actually doing anything that will have any impact. Like you're right. just saying the stadium, the stadium has been built. Yeah. The, the, the migrant slave labor that already happened. Those yeah. stadiums are done. Uh, like you. <laughs> Your time to stop that atrocity has come and gone. You blew it. You sat on your hands. You blew it. It's too late. Don't act like you're actually doing anything of merit now. Well, like the, the worst part, the worst part of it is, is like when before the thing was awarded, everyone's like, man, think of all the people that will die in Qatar when they build this with slave labor. And then they gave it to him anyway. And I mean, we all know why. 
And and yeah. then like all those people died and everyone was like pointing at it happening and being like, oh, God, look at all these people dying, just like we said would happen. And everyone was like, oh, that's terrible. But, you know, like the tournament will be fun to play in. So, you know, it'll be cool. Like. And then that'll be the end of it. Yep. Oh, yeah. No, come come December of next year. It'll all be fine. Everyone's and, and you know, and and and. I, I will fight it just as much as everyone of like the giddiness of a world cup will, will be there. will be around. Oh, totally. The buzz will be around Yeah, and I'll get swept up in it and have to, at the same time, kind of fight that, the thought in my head of like this, this is like, this is still bad. Like this shouldn't should, should be doing this. Like those, the, the hundreds of people that died to make this happen, like, we can't fix that now. Like we, no. the time to have made things right is over. Mm. And so we can either all boycott it, which again, I, no national team has said anything in the way that makes you actually think that they would legitimately consider doing that. Mm-hmm. No broadcaster has said anything that they would consider doing that. I'm sure sponsors will arise, but like we're waiting. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's all going to happen next year. It's not going to happen now. And that didn't happen five years ago when something could have been done. Yeah. So uh, enough of the vir- virtue signaling, either boycott the damn tournament yeah. or, uh, you know, just shut up about it and let's all just pretend that it's not as bad as we all know it actually is. Uh, what about your winner this week? Let's get into some positivity before the show ends. Um, I, I don't know if I, I feel like I'm going to steal your winner here because I, I know he's your guy. Uh, my winner is Gareth Bale. Oh, man, this was mine, um, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, th- there's been... Uh, there's been some really unfortunate moments in soccer over the past couple of years that deal with racial abuse. But up until very recently, there hadn't been a moment so just clear as day, prominent, and that actually involved a player making a racist remark in a, in a deliberate, malicious, and, hey, I know I'm doing something wrong, so I'm going to kind of try to be discreet about it, way towards another uh, another player. And so it, it, this uh, took place in, in a Europa match, what, two weeks ago, a week ago? Yeah. Uh, two days blending together. But it was uh, Glenn Kamara for uh, Rangers. Uh, and I, I'm blanking on the, on the, the dude's name uh, for the whatever – team yeah, that he played it, for it was andre kudela who played for slavia yeah. prague yeah some blockhead team and so he plays for what like the czech republic or something on the mm-hmm. national work. and so they were playing wales today and gareth bale uh as a ball was uh up in the air coming down he, he looks over his shoulder to see that that dude was right behind him and goes to play the ball, and at the same time, just absolutely elbows the dude right in the head. Oh, uh, it was, um, I mean, clear as day that he was lining the guy up. Like, there, I mean, honestly, no question at all. Yeah. And, I mean, there was question uh, as to whether or not Kudela was even going to travel with the Czech team for this match due to all the controversy swirling around him. Uh, but ultimately, it was decided he would play, and... Uh, I mean, he, he he clearly had a target on his back, and Bale just – he didn't even disguise it. Like, he just was like, nope, I'm going to throw this elbow at this dude. Yeah, and, coming at you, bud. Yeah, just, it's brilliant. It's it's truly brilliant, like, just serving up a, a nice elbow sandwich for a, a racist who very clearly deserves a bunch of elbow sandwiches. So, uh, yeah, uh, there's our dual winner for this week in a – a perfect way to end this week's show uh, with with some happiness that we'll share together there. Where we, I think what maybe in next week's show or the week after uh, we got our MLS preview coming. Excited about that. Yeah. 
I mean, we're doing full breakdown of all, however many teams there are, uh, starting with Sacramento. Now. Yeah. We'll, start, we'll break down their roster first. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with them. Uh, so get look look forward to that. That'll be coming here in the next week or two. Um, plenty of more fun things to do uh, and talk about now that Jeremy's got some time in his schedule for us once again. And hey, come May, we'll actually be in the same room. Mm. Plenty to look forward to. What a moment. Uh, as, as always, thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you want to get a hold of us, Jeremy is at Jeremy Lance. I am at Wrong Side of Pond on Twitter. Uh, it, it's been fun talking to you once again, and we shall do it again soon. All right, folks. Bye. Bye.